General, we're absolutely honored to have you here, honored to have you be a member of our association, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you and your presentation. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, being a Georgia guy, it's great to be back in Georgia. And it's great to be with uh, individuals who have worn the cloth of the nation. So, guys, thank all of you for your service and sacrifice. And I looked at the tape that was introduced earlier about Vietnam, and boy, I'll tell you what, that really brings it home when you look at that 18-year-old kid. And it sort of brings that back and sort of resonates with you. But the thing really resonates with me when I see the Vietnamese people, and I was there for the evacuation of Saigon in 1975. As a matter of fact, I was the operations officer for that. And I recall pushing those helicopters off the Blue Ridge, the Okinawa, all those uh, ships. Uh, but the most telling event in that whole operation was uh, there was two helicopters that came out of the embassy after I left, but I was the last helicopter coming out of old Mac B compound. And I had to look about 35,000 Vietnamese people in the eye. And with moms there with little babies saying, Major, would you take my child with you? And I had one 53A helicopter, which was designed to take, Larry, I think about 20 people. And I had 49 Marines to put aboard that helicopter and pull them out of Vietnam. And I had received an earlier call and they said, Major, and I was in civilian clothes, and you didn't want to get caught in uniform in civilian clothes back in those days. And they asked me, I said, Major, if you can't make it out, your only option would be to take those 40 or 50 Marines and E&E &E through the Mekong Delta and try to get to the beach someplace. That wasn't a damn option for me as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and one of the guys, interestingly enough, that was aboard that helicopter, just for the sake of the Marines in the audience, was the regimental commander who later became the commandant of the Marine Corps, General Al Gray. And he was insistent he was going to be the last individual aboard that helicopter. And uh, I've been back three times and going back for the third time here next year to visit Vietnam. And just what a wonderful group of people. And I tell you, I just sort of reflect on what we did right. We never lost a fight and what was done wrong north of here in an area called Washington and the reason that didn't come out right. And I was thinking about the comment that was made about the book Nuts, uh, or the comment Nuts at Baston. And I'm, I'm sure if uh, I had been there, my comment would be uh, some, some to the effect that you couldn't say it in a mixed audience. And so I think they've been a little bit different. We're talking about the Medal of Honor Museum today, and uh, I just want to go through this very quickly and just talk about its standpoint before we show you a very quick tape about Medal of Honor recipients, in which a lot of you had a chance to meet. And by the way, you've got a convention, hopefully, coming up here in a couple of years, coming to Atlanta, and it could be no better town for that convention to come to just because of the patriotism and support. And I should have said earlier, being a newbie, they didn't ask me to pick up the dishes this time. Guys, I owe you one. But uh, let me uh, just say, we've got some documents in, uh, for your interest, if you're interested in taking them away. First of all, the Medal of Honor Museum, the first thing people ask me about the Medal of Honor Museum, is this thing going to work? And let me tell you, it, it's going to work if we build it. Right at this moment, coming to Patriots Point, Incidentally, we've got a brand new Vietnam village there. You, you guys ought to come see this thing. It is first class at Patriots Point. It takes 206,000 people per year coming through the door of the Medal of Honor Museum for it to work. Patriots Point is getting about 345,000 people per year coming to Vietnam, coming to Patriots Point. If we build it, it will work. The business case is there. So it's not. I don't have any concern about the business case. And the grain and the established credibility for this business case for this museum, we spent almost a half a million dollars in a two and a half year study. And all the numbers are there for you business guys. And if you're interested and really want to get behind this and need to take this back to the office and study it, we've got about 10 copies of the business case for this museum. 
and it is done first class by a company out of St. Louis called PGAV. And they got just great credentials, and like I say, they spent about two and a half years. And this was my, my first attempt with the museum business. I don't know if you've been to the World War II Museum. How many have been to the World War II Museum down in New Orleans? Well, I was the chairman of the board of that, so this is not my first attempt to, to deal with the museum, and I was involved in that when the first donation I got for the World War II Museum was 500 bucks. And now that's a half a million dollar effort. So this is not my first tip in being involved in this. Also, we have a copy of a brief uh, we presented last night. And again, I don't want to go through all the details of these two briefs, but if you're interested in a copy, please, please, if you would, pick up the copies over here on the table and take them away. And they're just a very limited number. Also, there's a handout on your table. Uh, that handout, very interestingly enough, if you've had a chance to open it up the trifold, there's a listing of all the Medal of Honor recipients from Georgia. And there's only three living recipients from Georgia alive, myself being one from a little town called Lumber City, Georgia. I don't know if you ever flashed through Lumber City. Uh, Ron Ray is another individual from Georgia still alive. Ron lives down in Florida and Joe Jackson is from uh, Newman, I believe, up in this area. And uh, Joe's alive, and I think he was here last year with you. So uh, we just, like I say, I'm gratified to be back in Georgia. We'll kick this off and just show you a little bit about who we are. And let me tell you, uh, of the recipients, and you'll see numbers here, and, and there's been over 3,000, but there's only 79 recipients alive. And if you take out the nine li living recipients from the war on terrorism, the average age is 77 years old. We have uh, seven World War II guys remaining and nine Korean veterans. And the marker in the sand, guys, to build this museum, we've got about four years. And let me say to tell you, the sun pretty well sets on the museum society. It'll go away after 25 members are left. So if we're gonna build, not only a home for Medal of Honor recipients, but for you guys. This museum not only represents uh, the Medal of Honor recipients, but it represents all who have served and sacrificed for this country. And the outcome of this museum, I want you to think about this. This is not about uniforms and weapons. This is about the spirit of America. And we want a young kid to walk in, and this is key to young Americans, 11 to 18 years old, walk in that front door. And when he walks out that back door, he or she, they say, you know, this is a great country. And we really, really thank those who have served and sacrificed this country. And I want to contribute. I want to do something for America. And if we can just create that image, that it motivates these young people. And we can do that. We fulfill the job. We've done the job. And this is designed not only for the current generation, 11 and 18 year olds, this is designed for those generations yet unborn. This is a mark in, the, in sand that we're gonna build this. And it couples with the character development program, which is going hopefully into all schools in the nation. And this will be the repository of all that information. And let's influence these kids. And I ask you guys to really, and gals to really get behind this and support me and support what we need to do to help our youth. If we don't solve this problem, if we can't solve this problem, they're not going to be in America. And that's what it's all about. We've got to do this problem. Okay, run the tape. The day I was born, I was handed a gem that is absolutely impossible to buy. That was my freedom. We've got a great country. We've got great people. We have kids that are, that are willing to put themselves at risk to serve us. This is a representation of the very best that America has to offer. It is the best country in the world, and I'm part of it now. My dad and mom were both uh, in a motorcycle club, and they rode Harleys. I had relatives that had been in the various services, uh, the Army, the Air Force, and one in the Navy. Uh, I always enjoyed listening to their experiences, especially the, the whole idea of giving something back. You know, when you're young, 
and we all had dreams about being a big star. And mine was baseball. I love playing baseball, and I played semi-pro. One day, Mom said, we got this thing. You've been drafted. I said, by who? I said, the Army. I said, Mom, the Army don't play baseball? Hell, I was not committed to a stay in the Marine Corps. I wanted to stay my required time and go into engineering. But I stayed for 34 years. I decided to go into service to learn a profession. All my life, I wanted to be an airplane mechanic. One day during the flight, an engine caught fire. And the pilot asked me what I wanted him to do. And I said, I know what to do. I'm just as smart as he is. I'm going to go to aviation cadet training. We landed at Tonsonute, and uh, they had a mortar attack just as we landed. I was 19 years old. What's this? What's going on? It was a very uh, interesting welcome. We landed at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we fired all day. Just before dark, a helicopter came in, and a major got out. And he said, your probability of getting hit tonight is 100%. So prepare yourselves. Much of that afternoon, I do not remember. And I'm positive that fear wiped a lot of that memory out. All of a sudden, it was noisy, it was chaotic, and by that time, I was angry because my soldiers were getting hit left and right. You tend to think that you're invincible out there, and all of a sudden, uh, I get hit. But my primary thoughts were, uh, got to do something to protect those folks on the beach. Jesse had a crash landed. When I got over to Jesse's airplane, I tried to pull him out of the cockpit, and he said, if anything happens to me, tell Daisy how much I love her. And of course it did. Eventually what happens, you do start seeing people killed. And you end up realizing that you're a 19-year-old kid. And as a 19-year-old, you're not God. I was wounded, and I didn't think the doctor was going to repair me. So I might as well go all the way. I didn't figure out coming out of it anyway, so I thought just keep going until you can. Somebody yelled to me, and I looked down, saw it. How long had you been down there? I didn't know. You know, it's like time stop. It scooped it under me, and I said, hit the dirt, Doc. I got it in my hip pocket. And it went off. I ran out, picked up Captain Gormley in my arms, and brought him back. I ran up, and I said, come on, boy, let's get the hell out of here. Came over the wall, put the collective pitch down, put the cyclic back in my lap. Stood the helicopter under the tail. I just put one leg on each side of the cockpit and pulled, pulled him in head first right into the cockpit. So I told the members of my squad to withdraw. And I stayed in cover to withdraw. I didn't care what happened to me, but I wanted to protect my men under any circumstance. I didn't even think about it. I just did it. It was my job. I don't think what I did was above and beyond. I never have. People asked, do you regret anything about what you did? And I joked and I said, I would, probably would have grabbed it with my left hand. I don't have any regrets, I guess. But I, I'm a little disappointed that I had to leave the fight and leave all those guys there to finish it without me. Everything that the medal is around involves the people I was with, not me. I have the highest respect for the medal and the people who wear it, but I would just as soon die as take credit. I'm the one that gets to talk about what happened. I get all the glory. There's three grieving mothers whose sons were every bit as brave, and had they not been there, I wouldn't be here. We call ourselves recipients, and people call us winners, and as you see, we're not winners because we weren't in a competition for trying to win anything. We happen to be recognized by our fellow men, and so we wear this medal to honor the guys who really paid the supreme sacrifice because we are here today because of them. In the crucible of combat, one of the most important things you learn is the value of expending energy for somebody else that it isn't all about you, it's about all of us together.
You know, Emerson said that all heroes must at last be bores. I mean, for God's sakes, you can only have so many parties, you can only be honored so much. And so we decided we want to leave something behind. We stayed close to those around us. We remembered what's important. It's important to remember what you've lost, but it's important to remember what you have. That's what I wear this for. Every Medal of Honor recipient has met in his life someone who inspired him in his lifetime to be what he turned out to be. That's our goal, that's all we got left. Time for us to get out and give what we've learned through our life to these kids. It's not my story, it's our story. It's our story as a country. We are showing to the people that really matter, the kids of this land, that you too are just like us. That each person they meet has the potential to change the world. There's a platform we were given when we were given the ribbon of love. Let's use it to honor others. The Medal of Honor is not often given when things went well on a battlefield. It tends to come at a price, and heroes are often revealed. Some say I'm a hero, but it doesn't make sense because I got to come home. There's a verse in the Psalms that says that a man that is in honor and understands not is like a beast that perishes. And I've come to understand that what this medal represents, is not, it's not about me, but it's about men and women who value something so strongly that they'd be willing to die for it and they'd be willing to defend our country for it. And so they put on the uniform. When I think about the Medal of Honor, I realize that I'm wearing this medal for the 400 and some people that died in those four days. They got this medal. I was selected to wear it for them. Being a Medal of Honor recipient is something that you'd never even dream of. There's a great sense of comfort too knowing that you're now a member of a band of brothers that you never hear the word hate amongst them. You killed the enemy because of the love you had for the man next to you. You knew their lives. You knew their family. You knew how brave they were just getting where they are. So the most powerful emotion on earth is, is love. And we have to remind ourselves that and then convey that to the next generation. Eight of my brothers fought for a place we had called home. And more importantly, they fought for their comrades. And in the end, they gave their lives and that defense. I'll wear it with dignity and humility in their honor and carry each of them in my heart for the rest of my life. I look at that uh, movie and I look at you. There's not one bit of difference between those individuals in that film and you, sir. You're the same quality, the same caliber, and had the same commitment, and had the same sacrifice of this country of anyone, and anyone who served within that movie. You also may have noted the bell rang quite often. And those are the recipients no longer with us. And that bell is continuing to ring and continuing to accelerate. And with the 79, like I say, it's remaining. There's a very short time period if we can really capture the essence of the history of the Medal of Honor. And to all of you, like you, who served and sacrificed and placed it in the location where we can have it for kids today and for generations that are born, 
we've got to commit ourselves and got to do it very quickly. We have about four years, in my estimation, and the sun sets on the Medal of Honor and what it represents for the country. Not because I wear it, but what it represents as far as the, the, the part of the fabric of this great nation. And so that's the reason I'm here with you. And let me talk very quickly about the Medal of Honor Museum. Slide. You talk about the next generation, I want you to look at these two photographs with me. If I don't capture the spirit looking at those young kids and let them reach out and feel that piece of metal, and that's all it is, but it really that metal represents the life blood of so many who have served and sacrificed. And I wear it like all the recipients say. I wear it for all those young Marines and Echo Company Secretary and Fort Marines who didn't come home. And uh, we, if we can transfer that spirit to these young Americans, we have won the fight. Next slide. The National Medal of Honor Museum will be located in Charleston, South Carolina, off of Yorktown. Next slide. And why Charleston? The Civil War started there, and that's when the award started, back during the Civil War. The first award was to the Naval Service and the Army picked up the award. And the second feature of that, next slide, the first black recipient of the Medal of Honor. That action took place in Charleston, South Carolina. So if you look at the history of the Civil War, look at all the history associated with Charleston, South Carolina, it could be a better historic location in the country than that great city of Charleston. Next slide. The organization, and I won't talk about this in any great detail, but the Medal of Honor Society is where the uh, Medal of Honor recipients have the, their office location, which is aboard in Yorktown. It takes care of the business of the uh, Medal of Honor Society, and that's located behind the small museum at Patriots Point aboard in Yorktown. To take care of the financial responsibilities and provide us our financial support, we have the Medal of Honor Foundation which also uh, funds the character development program. And incidentally, the character development program is based on the actions of the recipients, and we're trying to get that in all the schools in the nation. Georgia has accepted this program all throughout Georgia. But the thing about it, it's a typical program. If we don't preserve it and have a place to house it for the long term, it won't survive. And another reason, the Melbourne Museum. They, uh, fund this program, and like I say, we've uh, already touched 2,000 teachers and over 5 million students. So we're just beginning this effort. 5 million is, is, is you well know, looking across this nation, it's not even a good beginning. We really got to get emotionally behind this, but we got to have a place to house it and coordinate it from. The Bellavana Museum Foundation is what is involved with the uh, building and raising the funds necessary for the Melbourne Museum and make sure we get it right. Uh, Pat Brady, how many know Pat Brady? Pat Brady is heading up the, head the subcommittee. It will review all the exhibits inside the museum and make sure, this advisory committee makes sure that all those exhibits inside the museum represent what the Melbourne Society and what the veterans community wants it to represent. So it's going to be a first class effort and we have selected the best architects and the best exhibit designers in the country. They've already been selected to make sure this thing happens and it's happened first class. Next slide. This is the advisory board. You can recognize some uh, interesting names there. Don Ballard, good Navy Corbin, and some other folks there. Next slide. This is the Museum Foundation, which I'm a member of. Next slide. And interestingly enough, the guy who came down and cut the ribbon and uh, sort of introduced the site. I'm sure you can recognize Ross Perot, uh, very, very involved in it and in financial support for the museum. So it's not a bad start, guys. And next slide, uh, Gary Sinise, you recognize Gary? And as, uh, it's going to be a great national board, and we're really excited about it. Next slide. And uh, John Wayne's granddaughter, Anita Swift, not a bad addition. Also, invite her to 
be a party. She brings some doggone good whiskey to put John Wayne's name on it. <laughs> Next slide. This is the uh, location. Let me get over here a little closer. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Shot four is where the museum will be located. And this is the Yorktown. Shot four is about eight acres of land. And this land has been provided to us by the great state of South Carolina, one dollar per year for 99 years. And if you look at this side, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and look at, if you're in the real estate business, you realize this is probably one of the most valuable pieces of land on the East Coast. Side five next to us will be a commercial section, again provided to us again by the state of South Carolina. We expect to build, to build a conference center there, and some restaurants and hotels. So this whole area is being redeveloped. The 55 adjoining acres is out and been accepted by a developer. So when you come to Patriots Point in the future, this place is going to be first class. There are going to be hotels, there are going to be restaurants. It's going to be a real destination area. And it's right across the Ravenel Bridge. And guess who lives about two miles from there? Me. So I'm going to be looking at it. Next slide. straight. Uh, again, we talked about the visitor count and uh, for the business guys here, which all of you are, I look at the numbers, like I say, the number to make this thing work is 206,000. And uh, if you'll note, the number now at the end of the Patriots Point is about 345,000. And if you draw a one-day circle around driving to Patriots Point, it's amazing the number of people that's within one day driving. Uh, to get the picture point. So, the business side of this thing, which was my concern from the get-go, works. And it's not like so many museums that's built on a wish and a hope. This is built on a real business case. Next slide. And the timing is very much important. As I said, there's 79 of us left. Uh, if you discount the nine recipients from uh, the War on Terrorism, the average age is 77. So we've got about four years. We either make it happen in the next four years or it won't happen. It's over and done. And there'll never be a National Medal of Honor Museum. Next slide. Total number of recipients, and this changes almost every day. Uh, we're going south very quickly. Okay, next slide. Total number of awards by campaign, uh, I want you to note on the right, in contrast to the Civil War and some of the other wars, if you look at Vietnam, you look at World War II, and you look at Korea, and even to some degree the war on terrorism, you'll see the numbers were not in favor of being a Medal of Honor recipient. The great um, 
majority of them were posthumous awards. Next one. And I think this captures the essence of what we're trying to say. One opportunity to establish this museum and leave the legacy for this generation, 11 to 18 year olds and those generations yet unborn. It's a big charge, but we can do it. Next one. The character development program, I mentioned very quickly, uh, right at the beginning, is a component of this. Georgia has accepted this program, and it's based on the stories of the Medal of Honor recipients. And it's not about war. It's about the character and what character represents in terms of what are the qualities of the individuals we want young Americans to understand. We want the Medal of Honor recipients and you guys, the ladies, to be the mentors. We want you to be the role models. And we want to sort of give them the tools to understand it. And when I talk to them uh, in terms of this program, I talk about raising the bar and trying to motivate kids to raise the bar, challenge them to do better. And don't look at the role models sometimes that exist out there. Look at you folks, you gentlemen, and ladies as role models. Next slide. And finally, I'll let Ron, Ron, where are you? January 10th, Saturday, 2.30, tune in to see uh, NBCSN, used to be called NBC Sports Network, it's cable, NBCSN, the game is going to be live, the second annual Medal of Honor Bowl from Johnson Haygood Stadium in the Sudbury, the uh, Army Parachute team's going to jump in with the game ball, we've got 13 recipients that will be there, it's going to be an outstanding day, gather all your friends and uh, you know, the Braves are not playing and uh, the Falcons don't play till tomorrow, to the next day, so watch that game on TV, or if you go be in the Charleston area, come over and buy a ticket, we're giving away a, a Tommy Baker, the Mercedes dealer's giving away a, a free car. The tickets are $15. It's a much better chance than Powerball or, or anything else to scratch off. But do try to watch it. 2.30 uh, p.m. Saturday, January 10th on NBCSN. It's a cable channel. The books that General Livingston mentioned are over here if you'd like one of the studies. Each of you has his own uh, brochure, the trifold. There's some extras on the table. Please don't leave one on the table. All of you know someone that's not here that might be interested. Share this with them. And so please do not leave one on the table. Take them with you. And uh, we're just grateful for anything. Uh, it's a wonderful, we love Ross Perot's, but uh, it's the guy that sells clothes, he says, I like to sell suits, but it's the, uh, you know, the ties pay the rent. So $5, $10, whatever, we're glad to have it. We're an all-volunteer. 100% of your money goes for this museum. There's no outside, you know, people, consultants, and things like that. We've got people signed on board. Thank you very much, General. We're going to, uh, we had another tape where we're going to talk about, and we're not going to show that when we talk about why the Metal Water Museum. You guys understand why the Metal Water Museum. I mean, I don't have to commit you, so we're going to cut that piece because uh, uh, I know some of you have to get back and earn a, a real job or work a real job. And uh, I, I just want to uh, say to you all of you, I deeply appreciate the fact that you were considerate enough to show up today and let us talk about the message and talk about this museum in terms of not only uh, the Medal of Honor recipients, but all of you who have worn a call for the nation. And again, gentlemen and ladies, thank you for your service and sacrifice. And I hope you'll see fit at least to look at the trifold, consider uh, what you would like to consider giving, or if you've got some friends, there's extra copies of the trifold at your table. Take it and provide that to your friends. And would you, I to ask you to join me in making this happen. Not for, for me and not for you, but for those generations that are 11 to 18 years old now, and those generations that are yet unborn. We need to give them a real role model, and that role model is you. So let's commit ourselves to that today. Simplify to all of you, and thanks for inviting me.
Thank you, General. We um, are honored to have you here today, and thank you very much for taking the time to explain the program to us. We honor you with, I, we know you have some great challenge coins, but we're going to give you one of ours since you are our new life member. And also the next time that you uh, get a steak dinner, we've got a great bottle of Cabernet to go with it. So thank you, buddy. Well, since Ron is driving, I may just try a little on the way home. <laughs> I may need it when Ron drives.